A square-rigged ship on the Baltic Sea is inspiration to poet, artist, traveler, and adventurer. It is synonymous with the Scandinavian peoples, the Swedes in particular. A foggy daybreak finds us at the end of our long sea voyage and the entrance to the harbor of Stockholm. We anchor our own little vessel, the Wanderbird, and there she is, to wait for the rising sun to burn away the mists before we sail into the heart of the historic capital of Sweden. Stockholm is a city of islands and canals, which has given it the name of Venice of the North. On our way, we pass the famous Nordisk Museum and are soon gliding toward a veritable forest of masts that rise from the decks of scores of sturdy, weather-beaten sailing ships that have come home from every corner of the stormy Baltic and the Seven Seas. Here, their wings folded for a brief rest, they leisurely exchange their cargoes, soon to spread their gray sails and drift away again to keep up the traditions of their ancestors. Stockholm harbors one of the last commercial sailing fleets on Earth. These are the city's ferry boats, which ply like white swans through many canals with the regularity of streetcars. Stockholm is built largely on about 30 islands and is sometimes called the city between bridges. From atop the towering spire of the city hall, we get a gull's eye view of this metropolis of the north. Its occupation dates back a thousand years. In the middle of the 13th century, Viryar Jarl established the present city. It has been the scene of numerous bitter wars, yet through the centuries, it has been a very important center of art and culture. It's the home of the Nobel Prize Award seat of political power, and it has had much to do with shaping the destiny of both ancient and modern Europe. In certain respects, the city is ultra-modern. Modernistic is a more appropriate term. These are apartment houses, each with its own balcony and separated by plain but artistic partitions. The main street is something of a pleasant surprise to travelers from America. Although the traffic moves without apparent difficulty, no automobile horns are allowed to be used, nor is any person permitted to smoke while driving. Pedestrians are given all the brakes in Stockholm. Something to think about. Here's a familiar sight, though. The toy balloon has the same appeal to little Swedish boys as it has for all other little boys. One of the most interesting and attractive of all the buildings is the city hall. A product of recent times, it is considered one of the finest examples of modern architecture and has given its designer Rannard Östberg, an international renown. Its spire rises high above the city, crested at its lofty top with the three golden crowns of the Swedish coat of arms.
Its picturesque colonnades, with their artistically symmetric shadows, fascinate all who see them. Surrounding is an attractive park, at the edge of which the blue waters of Lake Mälaren flow out to the Baltic Sea. The architecture is a pleasant mingling of Swedish and foreign influences, particularly Venetian. Here is that part of Stockholm which has given it the title Venice of the North. Its many waterways that wind through the unique archipelago on which the city is built are amazingly clear and clean. The city's very modern sewage disposal system keeps the water entirely free of pollution. The old town, of which we here have a lofty view, still retains many medieval features and is rich in native picturesqueness. Even its open-air marketplace, where everyone comes to trade, still occupies the same site selected for it by the city's original founder. The streets are surprisingly narrow, some not more than 10 feet wide. These are necessarily closed to all forms of traffic except pedestrians. Archways occasionally permit the streets to go right through houses, and sunshine seldom reaches the age-worn paving, except for a few brief moments at midday. Stockholm also has its own variety of Coney Island. It is called Tivoli Park. There are free band concerts and vaudeville shows. Also Swedish merry-go-rounds. But most unique of all are the Ferris wheel swings propelled by the rider's own exertion. Apparently, young Sweden's idea of the man on the flying trapeze. However, for those who like the more serious and artistic, this government-owned national theater presents drama enacted by Sweden's foremost actors and actresses. In keeping with their noiseless street traffic, here is how they solve the problem where 27 main roads intersect in the city. By means of circles and ramps, the autos, streetcars, and other forms of traffic flow continuously and without a jam. Something else to think about. These are kilns in which some of the beautiful Swedish pottery is baked and hand-painted by women who are artists in their profession. Notice the earphones they wear, providing radio entertainment while they work. In some of these plants, you can find pottery in most every form, from beer mugs to pink elephants, or exquisitely delicate medieval princesses. Then to top off an afternoon in typical continental fashion, we have tea or something stronger at one of the attractive terrace cafes and watch the folks go by. Perhaps we may be fortunate enough to witness that ever thrilling and fascinating display of military pageantry, the changing of the guard and the trooping of the colors at the King's Palace. Led by the best band in the land, whose militant music 
makes something within one keep step, they parade past. There is nothing quite like it. For a foreign visitor and native alike, it always has the same irresistible allure and fascination. When it's over, we return to our glasses or our cups. Somehow the day has slipped away into that limbo of things not forgotten. Night is settling on the medieval spires and blue canals. Most of the busy little craft that through the day had chugged or glided along the winding waterways have come to rest in their own respective anchorages. Even the parks are deserted. All is quiet. And so in our very best Swedish, we say, Ayer Stockholm, the Venice of the North. <laughs> 